Thank you for joining us this morning. We're so glad that you're here. Thanks for taking your Sunday morning, uh, getting up and joining us, uh, and being part of this. If you're visiting uh, here at, at EBC, we're so grateful to have you here and, and welcome. Uh, we do hope that, uh, that you'll understand a little bit more about why we're here and who we are, uh, which is really, uh, it's about a person, the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we want to talk about him, and we hope that through the course of that, you'll have an encounter with him, understand a little bit more about him. If you're a follower of Jesus, that you'll be encouraged in following him, and if you don't know him, that maybe today will be the beginning of your relationship with him. Uh, as those of you that are our regular tenders, I hope that you're here and you're ready to engage as we study God's Word. We open the Bible. I already hear uh, notebooks clicking, which is good. So we have our study notebooks for the book of Romans. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Romans. It's probably one of the shortest series we've ever had. It'll only take us maybe a year plus to get through there. Uh, anybody who's been around Emmanuel will know that I don't think we've ever had a year series of anything. So this is a new thing for us. So we'll be in the book of Romans up until uh, the time of Thanksgiving. Then we'll take a break for Christmas uh, in the Christmas season. Then we'll come back in January and continue on. Right now we're slated to finish up promptly at the beginning of June next year. If you're thinking about when are we going to finish. Uh, and that's, that's uh, all th if all things go as planned, which uh, I don't know if that's ever happened. But we'll see if that happens uh, for us here. Uh, also, if you're here and you hear these notebooks clicking and you're wondering why everybody has notebooks, uh, you are welcome to have one yourself. They're on the back table back here. We've made them available. We do ask, though, that if you're planning on being here and getting engaged, that you'll take one of those notebooks. If you're not certain, every week we're going to turn out notes so that you can have the notes that people are clicking into their notebooks as you make up your mind. But we hope to to wrap you in and, and get you involved uh, that. And I hope uh, many of you that I hear the notebooks clicking, I hope that you're clicking them more than just this morning. I hope you come kind of revved up and ready to do that. Uh, I prayed that the Lord would help me answer the questions that people had this morning. Uh, and also I prayed that the Lord would help me to say the things that I needed to say, even if that wasn't your question. Those are both the things I've prayed today. Uh, as I come up here this morning uh, to talk about this passage. But before I dig in, uh, I want to talk about, we have a special, uh, really, uh, not a guest, but one of our, our beloved long-term members, uh, because of health and various other issues, has not been able to be with us uh, for a period of time. But he is here this morning, and it's Lee Imers who's sitting right there in the back. And anyone, uh, Lee, can you, this is right down here. There's Lee right there. Uh, and... Lee and his wife, Barb, have, have long-time beloved people at EBC, and we love them. Uh, and they've been going through some health issues and various things, and it's going to necessitate them making a major uh, life change. Uh, and so they're, they're going to be leaving the area and moving eventually to the Washington, D.C. area, uh, where they're going to be taking up residence. Uh, we may have Barb uh, actually come next week. We don't know. Uh, they're not planning on leaving in the immediate. I think it's next Monday that they're thinking about taking off. And so uh, Lee is here today. And I want to pray for them, pray for God's blessing on them. Also, I want to bring to attention, many of you know Ann Lurs, uh, Mike Mikesell's uh, mom, and uh, Karen Mikesell's mother-in-law recently passed away. Uh, we want to pray for them and their grieving. Uh, also, we want to pray that... Uh, uh, as I often do uh, at funerals, that everything that God wants to do in the house of mourning, everything that he wants to do in the lives of believers who are reminded uh, of, of sin and death and every unbeliever who comes and is reminded of the fact that life is ultimately not under their control, that they might turn to Jesus in that moment. So would you pray with me as we pray for Lee and Barb and also for the Mike Cells. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today. Uh, not because this is just a part of what we do on Sunday morning, Lord, but because you have given us access to you through Jesus, the God who rules and reigns all things, the God from whom everything that comes, you have made it, through whom everything that continues to exist, you sustain it, and to whom everything is moving toward the goal for which you have made it. Lord, in you we live and move and have our very existence today. And we come to you, Lord, uh, thankful that we have an audience before you because of what Jesus has done. And we ask in his name, Lord, would you bless 
Lee and Barb. Would you encourage and bless them? Lord, would you watch over them? Lord, I pray for their extended family uh, in these moves and changes. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would encourage and comfort them. I pray that there'd be sweet relationships. I pray for good care medically. Uh, Lord, I pray for safety for them. Lord, we're just so grateful for them. Thank you for all the ways. Lord, many of us, we have known your blessing and your care and your love, your direction and guidance that's come to us through Lee and Barb. And so we thank you, Lord, for them. And we pray for your blessing on their lives uh, today. And Lord, we pray for the Mike Sells, uh, Lord, in the loss of Anne. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, even though we're grieving, we're grieving with hope because she knew you. And we know that the coffin is not the final word on Anne. Uh, Lord, but I pray, Lord, the God of all comfort, would you comfort Mike and Karen? Would you comfort um, Mike's extended family? And uh, Lord, I do pray, Lord, as we reflect on her life and we reflect on life altogether, uh, Lord, would you draw people to yourself? Would you open up hearts uh, to see the desperate condition that they're in, Lord, and flee and run to you? And so, Lord, we just thank you for all you give us. We thank you for today. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open uh, to uh, Romans chapter 1. And uh, many of you know that uh, we're working through uh, these uh, memory verses. I'm stuck a little bit here. Sam, if you can forward me one. Um, I'm doing all kinds of pointing, but nothing's happening up here. Uh, one thing you may want to make sure that that little receiver, Sam, is laying on the other side of your monitors out there that's available to get to. That's a key thing. Now here, if you're um, memorizing the verses, which I hope you are, we're studying through the book of Romans. This is a great verse, set of verses to memorize. This is the beginning of a set of verses that we're going to memorize. And we're going to memorize a, a set of verses that come from the book of Romans that really lay out in kind of a concise way uh, why you need a relationship with Jesus, what Jesus did to make that relationship possible, how you get into a relationship with Jesus, and what happens when you do. So it's often referred to in-house as the Romans road, as a road that takes us from where we are uh, to a relationship really with the God that we have rejected. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't uh, started working on those, do that. One of the best ways to do that in your own notes uh, is not only to, you can get a flash card and make it for yourself, but one of the good ways to memorize something uh, is as you're studying through, you just write that verse out over and over and over again in your memory verse. And so you get to the point where you can work through it. And then hopefully the goal is not just that you can say it, you know, anybody who's grown up in the Christian world for a while uh, can quote different verses uh, and at different points in time, maybe you memorize them because you did it for a children's program or for an assignment, if you will. Uh, and then as soon as you set it for the assignment or for the program and got your badge or your award, you promptly forgot what you just did. Uh, what we're hoping is that you'll come to it and memorize it, understanding exactly what it is that you're memorizing so that you can explain it, not just say it. To yourself or to someone else, right? So would you read with me? Would we all stand together? And we're going to read our text today, and we just read it together uh, as we go. <clears throat> Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Thank you. you may be seated. God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, this is one of the most famous statements uh, of Paul. Many people know this one. It's one of those ones you, uh, a lot of people know John 3.16, but many Christians are aware of this statement, I am not ashamed. Now, I want to begin with uh, a thought here for a moment. Uh, our title of our sermon today is Unashamed, and we want to reflect on this, this very idea about what it means to be unashamed. But I want, to, I want to begin that by talking a little bit about what does it mean to be ashamed? What does it look like? How, how, if, if you're unashamed, it, it's the opposite of being, 
you know, unembarrassed. If you're unashamed, it's the opposite of being embarrassed or ashamed of something. And so I was thinking about this whole question, you know, what, what does being embarrassed at someone or something look like? Why does this happen? You know, how does it happen, right? We know in human relationships, you go from, you know, one of the characteristics that's often, you know, in romance novels is the guy who is so in love with the girl that he literally makes a fool out of himself, right? From Cyrano de Bergerac, right, you're standing out and you're singing at you know, a balcony and you're crying out to her your love or you're, you're kneeling in public or you're just doing something absolutely crazy and you don't care that everybody says he's just a real idiot. That guy's just an idiot, right? You don't care because you're completely unembarrassed about identifying with the fact that you love this person. So you want to publicly say so. Matter of fact, you, if somebody doesn't get it, you're just sad for them that they don't understand how sweet it is in terms of that. So we know what it looks like, but how do you move from somebody who is your first love, and we use a a word that that John uses with the church at Ephesus, how do you move from some of your first love that she becomes your ex? What's the process that that happens? How do you lose that first love? What does it look like that gives you any indicators that you're heading down the wrong path? Now, I want to give you some pictures of, right, what embarrassment looks like, and we'll talk about this process. Uh, I've said this before many times, this is years ago, I used to, uh, I taught a Sunday school class up in the top floor of the, of the second wing over here, the education wing, and I got there early to get the class all set up, and I could watch people get out of their cars, right, it's just a little, a little drama unfolding in the parking lot, right. Uh, and in our church, the drama really unfolds from like 10 to 10, 10, 10, 10 to 10, 10, right? Uh, Those are the people, we start promptly at 10, but that means in Emmanuel time, we get started at 10, 10, right? Uh, But you find the people that had planned to get there on time, but they're not, they didn't make it for some reason. Uh, And what you get to see is, you get to see what they look like when they get out of the car. Uh, And one of the things that I often saw is you would see this family with teenagers and you'd see them get out of the car and the mom and dad would go this way and the teenagers would go as far away from them as they possibly could. And they're heading on the other side because something didn't go well. Another one is when I I, I, uh, teach out at Cedarville uh, and there's Cedar Cliff Schools, this is about five years ago, and I was uh, walking down the street and I was watching this this mom and boy have this really heated conversation inside of their car. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but he was, what was happening is he wanted to get out of the car before they got to the school. He wanted to get out. Mom, mom, don't take, no, I'll take you right up to the door. No, mom, no, no, let me out right here. So she lets him out for a nice two-block walk, right, because he's embarrassed to be seen with his mom at school, right? Of course, this is why parents, right, that's exactly why moms run up to their boys, right, when they're 15 or 16 and lay a big one on them, right, in public, right, because it's just so enjoyable, right, to see them get embarrassed. But when you think about that, those are the kind of things, what are the characteristics of embarrassed? Or a family, this is a little darker, a family gets embarrassed at the black sheep in the family, Somebody who's just turned their back on everything that this family believes or holds dear and they get together, they don't know how to deal with them, right? And some of the, it gets hushed tones when you go to talk about them. Or instead of a, a smiling face, you get to see people's heads start to hang, right? Or they begin to realize, and this is one of the things if you've ever been involved in prison ministry, that the shame of, of a dad or a mom who's in prison hangs over the ones who aren't in prison, and the family that's associated with them. That's a little darker. What does it look like? Well, then you don't want to talk about them much. You don't want to say too much about them. You don't want, you're hoping, right, in the world of the internet and social media that somebody doesn't, right, type in your name and find you, all those kind of things. Or spouses get embarrassed at at their spouses, you know, you get, uh, as in doing marital counseling all the time, you find this couple, and this is a classic thing, uh, you're attracted to your opposite, right? You're attracted, you love, they compliment you in ways that they don't, and then all of a sudden, you are the introvert, and your spouse is the extrovert, and they just embarrass the snot out of you every time they go somewhere, 
Oh, no, 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 don't do that. No, oh, right? Or maybe they just blurt things out and it embarrasses you, right? Or something doesn't go well at their work and then all of a sudden you find yourself struggling with just delighting in them. So I want to talk about this process here with you a little bit. What, what, is it, what happens when we get embarrassed about Jesus? What does Jesus' embarrassment look like? Right? As Christians, what does it look like when we get embarrassed about Jesus? And this is the issue here when Paul says, I'm unashamed of the gospel. Really, he's unashamed of the Jesus who's at the core of the message. The message of the gospel that we're going to talk about, Jesus is front and center. It's what God the Father did in Jesus by the power of the Spirit to restore and reclaim rebels. That's the gospel. And when Paul says he's unashamed, he says, I'm I'm unashamed of Jesus. Now, you know, in our culture, it's Jesus still has a cachet in different places. Just as long as you reshape him into a way that's a friendly Jesus. But Jesus is really, uh, you can use his name and people think he's fine just as long as Jesus doesn't step on their toes, right? And one of the things that happens, I want to say this a little bit later, we'll come back to it. One of the ways that you know that you're embarrassed about Jesus is when you try to reshape Jesus to make him palatable to other people instead of just let Jesus be who he is. So we'll talk about that. What does that look like? Now, I want to refer to this kind of process here that happens uh, in the process of embarrassment or shame uh, and, and what happens a little bit in terms of Jesus and what happens to us, why we as Christians become people who are embarrassed of Jesus or embarrassed that, right? I say this to my students often, as you go through life, the question that will come back to you again and again and again, is it really true? Is it really true? that everyone needs a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and if they don't have that, they really have nothing. Is that true? Is that true? Because the biblical wager is, is that Jesus is not only the center point of all history, but he's the one before whom everyone will be summoned for judgment. He is the coming judge of the living and the dead, and he's such a powerful judge that he resurrects everyone, past, present, and future, to stand before him and give an account. So Jesus, right, in terms of this, is what happens to us when we get embarrassed of Jesus? What's the process? Well, I think it starts, and again, I'm not uh, saying this here, I think it starts when we get separated from him, right? When you see a couple and there's an affair that happens in a couple, uh, they don't wake up on Thursday and say, you know, today's Thursday, what is today? Affair Thursday, right? Somebody needs to put that out on Instagram. It's Affair Thursday. We don't have a day that starts with A. Maybe August affair, something like that, right? Right? we got to figure out something. Nobody does that. Nobody wakes up and says you've got a vibrant relationship with your spouse or you have these great friends and you don't have, you know, dump your friends day, right? You just don't have those. You don't wake up and do that. Something has to happen to that relationship before you start to drift away from it. And so little things happen that put dead spaces in between you and that person. Sometimes it's an offense. Sometimes it's a difficulty. Sometimes they do something that really embarrasses you. And so it puts a little uh, space in between you. Well, when it comes to God, sometimes the things that create separation between us as God is, I've got a plan, God, and you're not working the plan. God, you're disappointing me. So I got a plan, right? I want to, some, you know, I always joke about it in college, you know, I got a four-year plan of exactly where I want to be at four years. And if I end it four years and I'm walking out by myself, God, excuse me, that's not the plan. Some of us have a career plan. Some of us have a certain uh, financial plan. Some of us have these kinds of ideas. Or we have this unspoken plan about the kind of family that we want. And we're expecting, you know, I'll get married, we'll have these three kids, and this is what we're going to have. And then you come and you get married, and all of a sudden you find out that you're infertile. And then all of a sudden, you didn't even realize how important that plan was to you, but you're super disappointed in God. And all of a sudden, you become, you become like a child, an abused child. You just kind of squeeze in a little bit from God, and you get a little cold to Him. You're not going to run from Him, but there's a little deadness there. 
right? Or maybe it's, you know, God, I've been praying and praying and praying, and this even gets to be more difficult. God, I've prayed and prayed and prayed, and I know that you said your heart is that people will, will come to know Jesus. That's what you said your heart is. Why? Why hasn't my son come to Christ? What about my mom? What about, what about this person? I've been praying and praying and praying for them. God, what's going on? Okay. And so all of a sudden, we just kind of step back a little bit. Or, you know, God, you know, I'm on Instagram all the time. And God, when it came to gifts and talents, you just put me on the, like the two percentile. Right? Like uh, I, I was on the train and you did not load my car with very many things. Right? The looks one, not there. The brains one, not there. Uh, the ability to say really cute little uh, quips like in, you know, five or six words. I just can't do that. Why can't I do that? Why can't I put good titles on my Instagram posts? Daggone it. And I can't, I can't come up with any clever hashtags. Right? What is wrong with me? Why didn't you give me better talents? And, and then people feel that God's let them down. Why do I have to struggle with my weight when this guy over here eats like a daggone pig at the trough and he's getting skinny? What is wrong with that? Right? I haven't watched my weight my whole life. And I had guys when I was in college who would tell me, Greg, you just got to do this and do this. And I'm sitting there watching him eat. And he's eating like five suppers. And I said, don't talk to me about self-control. You don't know anything about self-control. Okay? You don't know anything about that. Well, why, why do I have to have the metabolism that runs like molasses in winter, right? Why, why can't I have, you know, I'm just heated up, right? So I can just go out there and, and cram biscuits, right, and enjoy them. Okay, I, I don't know. I just don't have it. And we get disappointed with God, and we compare our contrast, and especially in this world, we get depressed, and, and, and to put it even darker, people commit suicide, right? We get disappointed. Then we say, maybe it's one of these God, how could you allow this to happen to me? How could you let this happen to her? How could you let this happen to them? Okay, those are all real questions. And when you read through scripture, there are people who cry out in the Psalms, God, where are you? God, what's going on? God, it seems like the people who curse you and are standing against you, they're, they're, they're triumphing. They're crushing your people. What is going on? It seems like God somehow... You're not on the throne. Can I trust you that you're good? Can I trust you that you're powerful? Can I trust you that by following your way, it really is the way to live? Or how about this one? Okay, this one I meet all the time. You wouldn't believe what those Christians did or what that church did. That's it. I'm done with those hypocrites. Right? I'm done with those prudes. Right? Here's a good British word. I'm done with those prigs. Right? the kind of legalist, uptight people. I'm done with that, right? And so God's people become some way a spokesman or a distance us from God, and we get separated from him. And I've heard people, oh, I used to go to church. I used to, but, you know, I don't go to church anymore. Well, what about God's call for you to be with the people of God? Well, ultimately, your problem was with God, isn't it? Here's a, one that happens in the moment. What about those arguments? I, I just heard Kitchen, right? Or I heard Sam Harris. Or I just heard one of these uh, new atheists. Man, those arguments seem awful compelling. Maybe, I don't know, is it true? So we get a little dead space. Something happens. We hear something. And we get a little dead space. We don't, we don't pay attention to it. And then what happens is it silences us. It silences us. Right? So the guy who got married to the girl that he would make a fool out of himself, all of a sudden it seems a little embarrassing to be so outright identified with her. Matter of fact, he's a little irritated with her now because he's lived with her for a couple years. Right? All those different things. And now he realizes he's, 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 uh, he's never had so many questions asked of him in his life. Right? When he gets home, he's got like 30 questions to go through. And he's never had so many uh, disagreements. He's not been disappointed with the things that have happened. Now all of a sudden, it's not that he's walked away from her, but little deadness has walked in, and now he's just not so excited about it anymore. It's not his first thing that he says. It's there. He's still got the ring on. But there's a little silence in terms of that. And in our culture... There's inducements for us to be silent about the gospel. 
So if, you're, if you distance yourself from Jesus because of disappointment or because of, of, of fear or because of, of a reversal or because you've got doubts about something, well, then there's a lot of incentives in the culture for you to stay shut up, right? Because here's what the gospel tells people, right? So I'll give you some here. The gospel tells people when you tell them, it's what it's going to tell us today, you're a spiritual failure. That's what the gospel declares, Someone needs to deliver you. This is offensive to those who think they're basically good and who attribute whatever is bad to them to somebody or something else. Right? We live in a culture right now that avoids personal responsibility for anything. You know why I'm so messed up? It's my parents. You know why I'm so messed up? It's the culture. You know why I'm so messed up? It's those racist people over there. You know why I'm freaking out in the store? It's because men are evil. Those, that's a place we are. Well, the gospel says, no, no, you're evil. You're a failure. That's offensive to people, right? Number one, to take responsibility. The second thing it says, you're spiritually powerless. You can't save yourself. And we live in a culture that says, no, 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 no. If you just hear the right TED Talk, right, or you get the right, in, you know, guy to, in, to inspire you, or you get the right little, uh, you know, workout person, right, you can have a chiseled body like them. And the answer for you is just find the right guru, find the right influencer, right? Find the right direction. And if you figure it out, you can fix yourself. Well, this gospel says, nope, you're powerless. You're not only broken, you're powerless to fix it. That rubs raw. Okay, third one. Here's one that's even difficult. You're spiritually no better off than anyone else. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many uh, women want you. I don't care how many men want you. I don't care any of those types of things. No one has a spiritual leg up on anybody else. I don't care how many Harvard degrees you have. None of that's going to save you. This is insulting to people who think their pedigree or behavior gives them some advance with God. That's the problem. Then the last one... And this is probably the one that's hardest as, as far as uh, the gospel is concerned. You only have, this is what the gospel proclaims, you only have one hope, Jesus. One. Wait a minute. Come on, Greg, you bigot. Who do you think you are that you think you know what's true for everybody? Really, there's only one way to God. There's only one way out of life. And Paul is saying, I am unashamed to proclaim that God has acted in Jesus Christ to provide salvation for everyone, which means everyone needs it, and that's the only salvation that there is to be had, right? So if you've separated from Jesus and you've gone silent, there's a lot of pressure coming, right, to exacerbate that distance between you and Jesus and fill that and continue to make you si more silent. Continue to make you to go in your closet. Continue to make dumb down your, your testimony to take Jesus off of your lips, right? Now, I mentioned this to you before, but I've, I've found about myself, right, the longer it takes me in a, in, a, in a relationship where I know somebody for the first time to mention that I'm a follower of Jesus, the greater the likelihood it is that I won't mention it at all. Because as a follower of Jesus, there's one way to represent Jesus, and that's to be a Christian, you should act like a Christian. You should be a person of integrity. They shouldn't think at your job that you steal things or that you badmouth people or you try to climb over people and use them. That shouldn't be a part of what it means to be a Christian. You should be somebody who forgives people. You should be somebody who's willing to take a hit, right, and handle it differently. That's to live as a Christian. The second one is, is where you come out and say, I am a Christian. Well, that's when not just that I'm a religious person, or I'm a person of faith, I, I just want to challenge you how much it is to say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. That's different than to say you're a person of faith or a religious person, right? The big change is when you move over here and say, Jesus has changed my life. This is the sweetest thing. I know I'm broken. I know I'm still growing. I know I've got things that, that I have to clean up because I'm on the way, but I want to recommend Jesus to you. That's the big line the cross, right? So if you, get, if you get separated, you'll go silent, and then you're open to being seduced by some other suitor. 
okay? You're, you can't exist just hovering, right, in a, in a fetal position away from Jesus. If you're away from him and you're going silent for him, you're going to have somebody that's going to come in and appeal to you. And you're going to go there because you can't live under that pressure and that distance all by yourself. You're going to look to something else. And Christians can run to all kinds of crazy things to try to fill in the void. So that's the process that if you think about shame and what, has hap- what happens to you is this process. And we're going to come back and we're going to talk about that. But as we dig into Paul, this is the first thing he wants to say. So if you're writing your notes down, this is where you want to fill in some blanks that I've given you here. And I'll give you some chance to fill in the blanks so that uh, I can get your attention back after your blanks are filled in. But he's on the shame first of the message. Okay? And I'm going to do something here that I don't normally do. Uh, I'm going to read to you uh, a, 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 an account of the gospel. And one of the things you're going to you'll find here, uh, what Paul does here in 1, 16 and 17 is he mentions the gospel. The only thing that he doesn't do is he doesn't define it. So if you're sitting here right now and this is the gospel and you're saying, well, that's, that's an in-house term. What is that? I've heard it before. Uh, it's, it just means it's a, 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 an English word that's used to render a Greek word that has to do with good news, a proclamation of good news. Okay? And the question is, well, what is that good news? Right? If it's such good, what is the good news? And the, what Paul does here is he says, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The whole book of Romans is going to explain what he means by the gospel. So it's an introductory one, but the passage that we're in is primarily about giving two reasons why he's not ashamed for it. So before we get there, I'm going to give you a little preview of the gospel, of what it is that he's there. This is the head one, and, I, and I'll say this here. I use this phrase, the triune God, right? That's, the term is Trinity. Our God is three persons in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? And one of the things as you read through the book of Romans is what you find out is that God is the architect of the plan, God the Father, It's from his heart and his good pleasure comes this plan to rescue and reclaim humans. Christ, with the heart of the Father, comes to do the will of the Father. He's not constrained against his will. He's not forced to do anything, right? He comes with the heart of the Father to do the will of the Father, and it's his work that's central. He comes to the earth. He goes up onto a cross. He dies, and then he resurrects from a grave. And now he's ascended to heaven, and we're waiting for him to return. Well, then, the... What God has made possible in Christ is made effective for people when they put their faith in what Christ has done. Well, to put your faith in is to say, God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. God, I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that I need him. It's the Spirit of God who opens up your eyes as a sinner to the fact that you are a sinner. And it's the Spirit of God that enables you to put your trust in him. So the gospel is a work of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and it's not only to reclaim individuals, it's to reclaim the world, right? Now, as we're reading through, when you get to Romans chapter 8, you're going to find out that what God's doing among us is not just to give you fire insurance, if you want to put it that way, so you're taking hell out of your future, which it does. It's not just to say that you're forgiven now and and God no longer is his wrath moving toward you, which it is if you aren't forgiven, Romans 1.18. But it's more than that. It transforms you. It makes you new. As a matter of fact, it's going to eventually transform everything. So when Jesus came along, right, he wasn't speaking with hyperbole or exaggeration when he said, the meek, those that come under my rule by belief in me, will inherit the what? The earth. Okay, that's not exaggeration. It's not hyperbole. That's indeed the end of the story that he's after. So let me give you this account of it. What the gospel is, it tells of his mission to reclaim and restore, and here too, reclaim and restore and judge the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve in the face of their rebellion against him. What humanity has done and continues to do in their rebellion against God is the highest of crimes and the worst of offenses. It is of such immense proportions that no penalty could be too severe. Yet God is motivated by his own good pleasure to allow his creation 
to regain the life they forfeited. His love moves him to bring about the conditions that would allow his creation to fully reflect what he created them to be so that they could know the life they were created for and so fully display his glory. Over the ages, right, we're in the middle of a a story that's being told over ages and ages. Over the ages, all of history was moved toward the decisive intervention through the work of Jesus Christ. The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, worked to provide for the restoration and reclamation of a people and the whole of creation. A reclamation that would, two things, simultaneously not compromise God's justice, but also allow Him to right sinners with Himself. In doing so, He could ultimately release all of creation from the deadly effects brought about by His just judgment on human sin. This meant that the penalty for sin must be paid. The transformation that is necessary to restore intimacy with God must be provided. How are we going to get back in the garden? The rebels needed a mediator to be a go-between between them and a holy God. They needed a sacrifice that could stand in their place to take the punishment for their sin and cover it. And they need a king who can bring back true flourishing and vanquish their enemies. Jesus is the answer. Jesus was born of a woman according to God's plan. To protect and satisfy God's justice, the rebels needed one of their own to pay the penalty for their offenses against God and to win for them what they had lost. And so Jesus became a descendant of Adam and Eve. He would succeed where Adam failed. God would make sure we knew who he was, not only by the life he would live, but by his lineage, by his bloodline. He had to have a unique bloodline. His lineage is tied to the line through whom God's promise to reclaim and restore everything could be realized. So this champion had to come through Abraham, the father of the Jews, because God has promised to Abraham that it was going to be through him that he was going to bless all the nations. And this king had to come through King David because God had promised to David that his descendant was going to mount the throne and bring true justice and peace forever. Not only would he have a unique pedigree, this new king, but he had to be endowed with unique powers. To deliver on the promises God made to Abraham and David, someone more than Adam was needed to undo what Adam had done. The immensity of his mission demanded that he be the God-man. Jesus, the Son of God, humbled himself by becoming human. He came into the world through a miraculous virgin birth by the working of the Spirit of God. He took up and accomplished God the Father's mission, fulfilling it to the letter of the law through the Spirit. Jesus culminated his life by satisfying God's just judgment on human sin. He went to the cross and opening the way to come back under God's loving rule by offering up that blameless life for our sin and raising from the dead to defeat death and declare victory. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done, only those who abandon everything and everyone as their deliverer and turn to him will have the right to come under God's loving rule and out from under his judgment. Only those who put their trust in Jesus as Lord will be saved. He will return to consummate his kingdom and judge his enemies. He will recreate the heavens and the earth as the eternal dwelling for his people as he restores and reclaims his creation. Now finally... The book is going to go in as we wait his return. We live as his people by the power of the Spirit. Our gatherings right here are outposts of the kingdom to come. We have been changed and brought to life, but we await the return to experience all that this new life holds for us individually and together. We watch over as church Members, we watch over, we encourage, we warn one another as we follow our king out into the fight. We draw on the enabling of the spirit and his gifts. What are his gifts? God's word, God's people, God's ear through prayer. And we try to hold on to our identity and mission. Day in and day out, we fight the good fight to take ground for Christ's rule in our hearts. We fight for God's rule in the hearts of our friends and brothers and sisters, and in the hearts of those who don't know Christ as we anticipate Christ's return. We expect to be treated as Christ as we represent our King and declare that He is coming and has come. 
And so we step out. This is Paul's metaphor that he uses in chapter 8, declaring Christ's victory. And we step out as sheep among wolves who expect to get harassed and bitten. But we do so because we know that everything that really matters is secure and because our hearts have been changed so that they beat with compassion for our lost neighbors. And as we rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, our hope grows and our yearning for Christ increases. We long for the fullness of joy in his pleasance and the freedom from sin and death. That is the good news. That's the good news. That's the story that we're going to tell as we walk through the book of Romans, okay? So that's the message that Paul says, I have no shame. I'm completely confident in that message. And I'm going to tell it, and I'm going to live into it, and I'm going to commend it to other people, and I'm going to warn my brothers and sisters when they get sucked into something else because that's the message. The king has come. The king is coming, all right? So that's the message, all right? Now, let's move on. So first thing, he gives the first reason why. So if you notice here, if you were studying, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. And so it begins with that little word for, and really he's explaining why in verse 15, he's coming to share the gospel with them. Remember how verse 15 ended? This is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, right? And well, he explains that. Why? Because I'm unashamed of this gospel. This is the message that I'm unashamed of. And now he's going to give us two more reasons But these are reasons for why he's unashamed. So he gives the first one here. Because, right in verse 16, it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So that's the first of the reasons why he's unashamed. The second one will be in verse 17. Did you notice it begins with the word for? Another because. Okay? So you've got a statement. Why am I coming to share the gospel with you? Because I'm unashamed of it. Two reasons why I'm unashamed, right? So the first one is, I'm unashamed because of what the gospel proclaims, about what it's about, right? Faith in it by any person unleashes God's power to restore and reclaim just as he planned, okay? Now, so to restore and reclaim, it unleashes God's power to save, okay? And when we talk about what that is, it releases God's power to save And then when I take according to plan, he says, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. This refers back to God's plan to bring salvation, to bring restoration and reclamation through the Jews. Because Jesus was of what ethnic origin? What was he? Jesus was a Jew. Okay? So his plan. Now, here's four things that we want to come and talk about this one. What does it proclaim? The gospel proclaimed that that this message, right, and again he's talking about this, this message when it's met by a faith response through God's grace, it unleashes God's power to save. Okay, now this was, this was as radical as a claim back then as it is now, right? One of the biggest challenges Paul would say in 1 Corinthians when he proclaimed the gospel, the fact that if you believe on Jesus, who in the first century was what? He was a Jew who was crucified by who? Rome. And so the Christians are all out there saying, if you put your faith on this crucified Jew, and the Romans are going, hey, excuse me, you know, who is he crucified by? The Romans. The cross doesn't speak power to me, it speaks impotence. Because in the ancient world, how do you know that you have the favor of the gods? How do you know that God's power rests on you? You're winning. I don't look at the cross and say, winning, winning. Doesn't look right. And so many of the people in the secular world were going, that's the most stupid, moronic thing I've ever heard. That I put my faith in that guy and somehow that can transform my life? That he's a king? That he's going to come and rule? That I need to submit my life to him? That doesn't make sense at all. Right? So what Paul is saying here is that you have to understand who this king is. You have to look at his life and his ministry and you have to recognize that the cross was not the end of the story. The empty tomb was the end of the story. He came out of the grave. He defeated death. He's the only one that's gone through death and come out on the other side to talk about it. He's the God of all gods. He is the ruler of the world. So the cross itself takes its power from the person who's on the cross. It's not the cross itself that did anything. It's the person on the cross and what he was doing. 
So the issue here is it unleashes a saving power. Well, what does the saving have to do with? Right? Saving always has to do with at least two things. There's a multitude of things that are here. But saving is saving you from something to something. So when you're thinking about salvation, it's taking something away from you. It's delivering you, the idea, it's delivering you from something. Well, what are you being delivered from? The just penalty of your rebellion against God. That's what threatens you. It's not cancer that threatens you. It's not COVID that threatens you. It's not your wife or your husband or your boss, right? Or being unpopular or, or, or having two followers for your life, right, on social media. That's not, what, that's not what, what threatens you. What threatens you is the fact that you're estranged from the God who made you and you've offended him and rebelled against him. He has stepped in to right that relationship with him. But not only does it, it take care of delivering you from the consequences of your sin, but it delivers you to a new life. It brings you to life. And as we read through, especially chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, we're going to find out what happens when God restores the life that we've lost. He brings us to life. Over here, we were in bondage to a distorted way of viewing life. He's going to talk about it in chapter 1, is that uh, we took God out of our thinking, and so now we can't process life right. We can't even understand ourselves right. We can't understand each other right. We can't figure out sexually what to do. And so we're given to all kinds of destructive behavior because we've taken the God who created us out of our thinking, and we're trying to do it on our own. Here, God restores our ability to understand who we are, who he is, our neighbor, so that we can submit our very lives and know the life that God wants us to have. So this transition, so it unleashes a power to take a rebel and make him a son, to take a rebel and make him her a daughter, to take, a, take somebody who's a slave to sin and put them in a relationship with the God that they've been made that will bring them to life. That's what salvation has to do with. So it unleashes that kind of transforming power. Okay? Then the second thing is, he says here, it meets real human need. So he says salvation brings salvation to everyone who believes it meets the real need of every human being. And as we said before, Paul's going to spend the first three chapters, as we get there, to say that everybody is in trouble. Everybody is spiritually in trouble. And nobody can fix themselves. And so this message applies to everyone. Not, you can, you know, God doesn't help those who help themselves. Paul wants to make it very clear that if you're away from him and you don't know Jesus Christ, you cannot help yourself. And one of the reasons why you cannot is because you don't want to. And the key idea is what you need is to bow your knee before the God of the universe and recognize that you have rebelled against him. And you're going to need his enablement to make that happen. So it's for every person because everyone needs it. And then it offers life for everyone without exception. Not only does it deal with the need we have to be forgiven, not only does it right our relationship with God by taking care of the punishment that we deserve, but it gives us a, a relationship with him and brings us to life. Okay? And then it shows God's faithfulness. And so here, right for us as Christians, one of the reasons why I trust the gospel, one, is because millennia ago, God laid the ground for this message, right? Millennia ago, if you want to try to trace it, you can go back to Genesis 3.15 if you want to get started and talk about when Adam and Eve decided to turn their back on God and walk their own way. God could have ended everything right at that moment, but instead, in his mercy, pushed them out of the garden and he said that there's going to be a seed, a descendant who's going to come, who's ultimately going to deal with the consequences of your sin. They didn't know who it was going to be. Then along comes Abraham, and he says, Abraham, it's going to come through you. And Abraham was the father of the Jews. Abraham, this seed is going to come through you. You can read about it in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. It's going to come through you. We read on a little bit later on, we find in Genesis 49 that it's going to come through a particular line underneath Abraham. It's going to come through the line of Judah. And there's going to be a scepter that's going to be given to a king from one of the descendants of Judah. We find from Moses there's going to be a prophet that's going to come. It's going to be unlike any other prophet in Deuteronomy 18. He's going to come like me, and we're looking for him. And as we start to read our way through, we start to find people, and we think, oh, 
It could be David. He's a great guy. And then one day when he was supposed to be out to war, he lusts after one of his fellow soldiers' wives, commits adultery, winds up murdering the guy, and you're thinking, it's not him. Then his son comes along, Solomon, you think, ah, that's him, that's him, that's him. And then Solomon gets so wise, like his brains fall out, right? And he gets so wise that it's like spill out of his head, and he gets older, and he's an idiot. He's just an idiot. One of the things I've never forgotten from my time in Israel is when you stand over on the Temple Mount and you look over, there's three hills to the east. There's Mount Scopus, Mount of Olives, which we know, Gethsemane, and then there's the, the final one that's the southernmost hill, and it's called the Mount of Offense. So I ask, well, what's the Mount of Offense? Well, that's the mountain that Solomon built all of the pagan temples so that his wives could worship there. Right? So he's looking at there. So you... What happened to you, Solomon? It's not him, right? It's not him. And we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, waiting for who is this seed? What's going to come? We learned some things from Isaiah that he's going to come as a suffering servant. We learned that he's going to come humble, right? Riding on a donkey. We learn all these things about finally the pages of the Old Testament, right? The drum roll. Finally, the pages of the New Testament. It's Jesus. He answers all that. Who is he? He's a Davidic king. Who is he? He's from the line of Abraham. What does he come as a humble servant? What does he do? He suffers on the cross. What does he do? He comes out of the grave. And he makes everyone know that I'm the king. I'm the kingdom bringer. I can restore your relationship with God. I am God's mercy in flesh. That's the story, right? And so the issue here, God's faithless. We're believing on a message that God has said, I think I've proved my credentials so far. I'm unashamed of that message. I don't have you. And this stands in the face of your reversals. It stands in the face of your disappointments. Right? You read through the history of the people of God that they go through suffering and difficulty, have points of doing. And over all of that, God said, I'm faithful. I'm faithful. It looked in in a moment in the Old Testament where the people of God had been so unfaithful, they went under judgment under the Babylonians. It looked like God's promises just come to a crashing halt. God, will you? Will there ever be peace in Jerusalem? God returns in Jesus and says, yes. So when we get to the New Testament, Apostle Paul that we're reading here, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said, all the promises of God in Jesus are yes. Yes. Right? So why? Because of what it proclaims. It unleashes the saving power of God. It meets the real need of people. It offers life to everyone. And it demonstrates God's faithfulness. Okay, key idea. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, so I'm unashamed because of what happens when it is proclaimed. Right, so the word happens here. What happens when it is proclaimed. Here's what he says. For in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as written, the righteous will live by faith, okay? Now here, what happens, right, this is a a crazy thing about it. Paul reflects on this in his own ministry. Okay, today, as I share the gospel and as the gospel, the good news of what God has done in Christ and wants to do in you and through you, as you uh, abandon yourself and turn to him in belief and trust, That gospel is at work and God is empowering that message, not because of me. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with God being at work in conjunction with that message that will divide people in this room. It'll divide us either into those who bow and say, that is the message that I need to hear. I need to know that God. Or it'll turn me into someone who rejects that God and stands on the other side. And Paul reflected and said, That's such a weighty thing. Who's sufficient for that kind of ministry? Because God, this is the, God reveals himself. He reveals truth. He declares who he is. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Okay? So here's three things that I want to say. God reveals that he acts to right people with himself. Okay, now this is that a righteousness of God is revealed. Okay? Now, If you're a student of Romans and you have any commentaries, those two words, the righteousness of God, those three words, 
uh, there's a lot of ink spilled on those three words. Okay? And there's, there's at least three different ways that you might take that phrase. You could say the righteousness that is a gift from God, a righteous status with God that comes from Him, so God is the source of the gift of righteousness, uh, to say that is a right standing with God that He makes possible because Jesus took your penalty and now you get to stand in His righteousness. Okay? And that's going to be talked about in the book of Romans. A second one is, right, just keep them going, is that God reveals that he is righteous. Okay? He reveals his righteousness. God's righteousness is revealed. Right? That God acts consistent with his promises. That God is righteous and just. Right? That he does justice. Because this is going to be a key idea. And when we get to chapter 3 in Romans, he's going to say that what God did in Jesus was so that he could be just... Because our sin, in God's economy of justice, uh, we, he's not like us as human beings where uh, I sin against God and then God walks up and says, oh, that doesn't matter, Greg. That's okay. Don't worry about it. No, in God's economy of justice, that sin has separated me from him. It's distorted my very life. It has to be dealt with. And a part of that being dealt with is it needs to be judged. I can't bear that. But God, to be just and justify me, right me with himself, he can't compromise his justice to make me right with himself. So how is he going to be just and the one who rights me with himself? Well, he's going to demonstrate his righteousness in that Christ is going to become the one who stands in our place to take what ours is so that he can justify me because of Jesus. So the one is it's a gift that comes to us from God or it's God demonstrating his character, his justice, his righteousness. Or it's that God acts righteously, that God acts to save. Now, what I want to say to you about all, all of those are entailed in any one of them. Okay, now I know it sounds confusing, right? But if it's the gift of righteousness, well, then it's demonstrating God's own character in his giving the gift. You follow me? If you say God's righteousness, that's the biggest category that all of them would fit in. What's God's righteousness? Well, he gifts with righteousness and he acts to save people. This is why some people punt and go, let's put them all together. Okay? Because it's hard to figure out what's the exact theme. Now, if I were pressed for mine, this makes me old school with that one. The predominant one is to suggest that it's God's gift of righteousness he's speaking of. That God is, is the, the, in the gospel, it declares that God will gift you with righteousness and right you with himself. Okay? But at the same time, it's revealing God's righteous character and God is acting to save. You follow me? Have I confused you all? Let me muddy it all up a little bit more. All right. Okay. So the, those are the kind of ideas. So the idea here is what we're going to find is when the gospel is declared, it's going to declare you're lost. God did something about it in Jesus and if you turn yourself over to him, what will he do? He will write you with himself. He will apply Christ's righteousness to you so that you can be forgiven of the sins that you have and you can stand in his place with his righteousness and you can have a right relationship with him. You're back in the garden. That's what he'll do, right? So that's what he declares. So to the two things that he goes on to say, I think are proofs that get after that first statement. It reveals God. Well, why? Because this is proven by the growth of faith. And this is another one where there are about 15 different interpretations of this phrase. From faith to faith is the phrase. From faith to faith. In the NIV, it says from faith to faith, from first to last. They take it as a figure of speech, a, a, an expression that says that the Christian life is all of faith. It begins when you believe in Jesus, and it's a life of faith that you live out with Jesus. But it's not a stagnant life. It's a life that grows. Your faith deepens and expands. But it's the whole of your life. And that's true. It grows personally, and we're going to talk about that. But the other thing has been proven by the fact that this gospel has literally spread throughout the world. It's gone from Jew, from the faith of Jews to faith of Gentiles throughout the world. 
right? One of the reasons why, right, it's wrong to say that Christianity is a white man's faith or Christianity is an American belief or it's a Western belief. It is the predominant belief around the world and that the average Christian today, if you'll talk to missiologists, is a Nigerian woman. And the only thing that's common to that Nigerian woman and to the, the person that's hiding in China in a house church and the person who's out in, uh, uh, in, in, in our own mission field in California and the United States, right, I'm just kidding, or wherever they are, right, is the only thing that's common to all of them is they believe in the same Jesus. And they testify to the fact that I came to know this Jesus and he changed me. What do I have in terms of culture common with them? Very little. What do I have in terms of the way I've been raised? Very little. But they know the same Jesus. And this faith has grown, right? And this is a biblical way of describing it. It started, right? It, it, this is what Jesus, if you remember the little conversation with the woman at the well, this is John chapter 4. She was a part of a, a group of people that were Jewish half-breeds, the Samaritans, and they hated the Jews. They tried to ha create their own way of relating to Yahweh or God. And Jesus sits with them, and it sounds super offensive when you hear it, especially in our environment. <clears throat> and she's kind of bantering with him. And Jesus says to him, salvation is of the Jews. Why? Because it comes through Abraham, through David, through Jesus. But thank God it doesn't stop at the Jews. It goes to everybody, <laughs> which is the majority of the people in this room. The Jew and Gentile. And so this faith is increasing and growing around the world. Paul will use this. He, he'll even personify the gospel like it's out there running, and it's running to the ends of the earth in Colossians chapter 1. Okay. Some questions now. Let's come to the end. Oh, my goodness. Time is almost up. Okay. They asked me, the teaching team asked me, Greg, you're going to have to teach like a whole chapter. How are you going to do that? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. We'll try to figure it out. Okay. But here's, here's two things I want to leave you with, right? I want to leave you with, okay, two things. Here's some questions for your one another groups. Here's some questions for your own personal time together, right? Seriously, Scripture should, if you believe this is God's Word, this is God teaching you, you should be asking yourself for your own sake, is this true of me? Am I ashamed or am I unashamed? So what are the marks of being ashamed of the gospel? Now, we can think of the classic ones of, I just don't like to tell other people that I'm a follower of Jesus. You know, one of the ones that we don't often is when we're critical of other people who aren't ashamed of Jesus. You ever find yourself just feeling uncomfortable that another Christian is standing up there and talking about Jesus and all of a sudden you want to hide? And then we critique them and say, oh, if they just said it a little bit nicer, or if they just said it this way, or they said that. And I want to turn to them and say, well, when's the last time you shared Jesus? When's the last time you shared Jesus? Well, I just haven't found the right moment to. Are there any perfect moments to share something that you know is going to be uncomfortable, but could be the life changer for a life and eternity for somebody? Was there ever a missionary, right, that accomplished anything for the sake of the kingdom that said, I waited until there were just the perfect conditions? I know that shame shows up in me when I'm critical of other people because their boldness is making me feel ashamed of my timidness. How about, am I separated? Okay, seriously, are we, am I here today where... Relationally, I'm disappointed. Personally, I'm disappointed. I'm dealing with struggles. Things are going hard in my family. I'm struggling with different things. My job is difficult. And I feel like God has let me down or I'm disappointed. I feel distant from him. And, and so you're not praying. You're not talking to him. You're, you're trying to avoid people at church and try to keep people out of your life. And you're creating empty spaces. And empty spaces don't stay empty. Something comes in them. So are you, are you silenced? Are you being seduced by another suitor? Somebody pulling at you and so you're heading off in a different direction? Now here's, these are mine that I wrote out to myself. 
this week. I shared them with my family. Here's some aspirations that I wrote out for myself. I want to be a follower of Jesus who is embarrassed to Christians who are embarrassed by Jesus. I want to be embarrassed to Christians who are embarrassed to Jesus. That doesn't mean I'm angry with them, doesn't mean I'm condemning, doesn't mean I'm legalist. But I should be, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed at us as a church if we're embarrassed by Jesus. I don't want to be. There's, there's, if there's any person that I want to be known as knowing it's Jesus. How about the second one here? I want to be brokenhearted in fear for those who reject Jesus. I mean, is, does the importance of Jesus show up in the way you cry out for your lost loved ones? Do you really believe that they need him so desperately that you're crying out for them? That you're angling with them, right? You're trying to do everything that you can. This doesn't mean that we're overwhelmed. It doesn't mean that we're knocked out of the game. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean also that we're pushy and rude and we're taking something that people don't want to hear. It is one of the most difficult things to have someone that you share the gospel with stiff arm you and say, Greg, I don't want to hear about that anymore. Okay. But I'm going to get on my knees and pray that you'll be open to that. I don't know if it's a dad or a mom or a colleague or a son or a daughter. Right? And then thirdly, I don't want to prize any situation, any regard, any possession, any position, any relationship that requires me to be embarrassed of Jesus to have it or maintain it. I, I want to be a man that says I want to be faithful to Jesus and then let the chips fall where they may. If that means I don't have the job, let the chips fall where they may. If it means that people don't like me and I'm brokenhearted by it because I love them, let it be. Right? If it means my family turns on me, Jesus warned us, let it be. Because the best thing I can do for them is, is, is introduce them to Jesus. Right? That's what I want to be, by God's grace. All right, will you just stand with me? We're going to, be pray, we're going to pray and dismiss, and, and we'll let you go for the day. But I pray that you'll have some good conversations with your, your one another groups. Reflect on this your own. Uh, thank God that he makes us sufficient for a, a challenging task. But I just really want to encourage you that the core, right, the core of, of, of witness, the core of, of identifying with Jesus is love for Jesus. It's not duty. It's not fear. It's not the, the fact that that's what Christians are supposed to do. Right? You got a bunch of men in this room who watched a lot of football yesterday. Okay? You got some real fans. I even saw just a horrible shirt in here. It had Michigan on it. It was horrible. I almost ruined my morning. Where's Cameron in here? You got, you got, and you know, you know what you find about people? What you love, you talk about. You know that? And you don't have to ask, oh, that person, what do you really like? No, you just talk about it. What you love, you talk to any grandma, right? You don't have to ask them, you, you want to talk about your grandkids? You have to shut them up, right, about their grandkids. Right, and again, I'm not saying, this is not to guilt us. It's not to, to move us out because of duty. Separation creates silence. Right? So God help us, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you today. And Lord, we know uh, that we don't love you as we ought. We know that we need your help by your Spirit to open the eyes of our heart to be able to see how we have been loved, how we are being loved. Lord, the security that you've given us, that today everything that truly threatens us who know Jesus, Lord, has been taken care of by him. And Lord, the biggest thing that threatened us was you over against us because we had stiff-armed you and left you. But Lord, if, if, if you are for us, what can be against us? Help us, Lord, to live into that truth. Lord, fill us with delight and joy at what you have done for us. Lord, help us not to forget it. Help us not to wander. Lord, please reclaim some, Lord, who've been seduced by other suitors. Lord, please bring them back. Lord, fill in the empty spaces that come from life's difficulties. Help us to trust you in them. Lord, I pray that there's somebody who doesn't know you today. Would today be the day that they come to know you? 
Would you open their eyes to your wonder and goodness? And so we trust ourselves to you. We ask for us as a church, Lord, help us in all the little places you put us, in our families, in our, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our extended families. Lord, please, please help us, Lord, to identify openly with you and introduce people to you. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.